Show. I'm your host, Steph Gordon, and today with us on the show, we have Dr. Alistair Edgar. Now, Dr. Alistair Edgar is the Associate Dean of the School of International Policy and Governance at the Balsillie School of International Affairs, and he's also the Associate Professor of Political Science at Wilfrid Laurier University. From 2003 to 2018, he served as Executive Director on the Academic Council on the United Nations Systems. Dr. Edgar is also an advisory me board member at the Laurier Center for Military Strategic Disarmament Studies. Outside of the university, he is a chair of the board on the Canadian Landmine Foundation and a co-editor of Global Governance Journal. Dr. Edgar's research examines transitional justice in war to peace transitions and post-conflict peace building with special interest in Afghanistan, Cambodia, Kosovo, and Northern Uganda. Dr. Edgar holds a PhD in political science from Queen's University. He was a John M. Olin Doctor Fellow in Economics and National Security at Harvard University and was awarded a certificate in Russian Studies at Moscow State University. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Edgar. It's my pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks, Beth. I want to start off today by um, asking you, what is this transitional justice that you, your main research interests are following? Okay. Um, as, a, as a practice and as a body of literature, uh, it really emerged in the late 80s and early 90s, or mid 80s to early 90s, um, primarily in two places in the world, one Latin America as former military dictatorships or hunters were transitioning from authoritarian to to something else, right. um, fingers crossed democracies, but to something else. Um, and in Eastern Europe, uh, with the collapse of the Soviet empire, mm -hmm. uh, as former Soviet satellite states were then transitioning to independent states and again from authoritarian to something else, hopefully democratic states. And in both of those places, uh, the populations, the new governments, uh, and the old ones uh, faced the, the problem of what to do about the old regime. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, literally transition from one regime to another type. Um, um, and, and how do you address the abuses, the repression, in many cases, the disappearances, the murders, all of those things that the old regime um, may have, have enforced to stay in power? Right. Um, so, so back then it was very much a literally transition from one regime to another like mm -hmm. that. Um, since then, uh, it has, we, it still looks at that, but now a lot more of the literature and a lot more of the practice, um, is about societies that transition from war to peace, uh, societies that move from, from I, I, I don't like the word civil war because there's nothing civil about it, mm -hmm. a, a brutal wars in which parties have engaged in mass atrocities. Sometimes the governments have, oftentimes rebel groups or others have. So moving from that to something at, afterwards. Uh, so, so that transition from war to peace and from a ceasefire to a sustainable peace. Mm -hmm. So the literature covers all of those mm -hmm. um, uh, because all of those unfortunately are still examples that we have to deal with. Right, thank you. So I guess I would I would ask next, um, who is who is doing this transitional justice, and why are they doing it? Um, all kinds of different actors, um, mm. and being an academic uh, to try to answer that, divided into three three types of actor, two types of who is doing it: uh, international organizations or the international community right. are doing it, which most often means the United Nations. Uh, but it can also mean the World Bank, uh, other international organizations, or regional organizations like the African Union as well. So international or regional organizations are pursuing transitional justice in a range of different ways. Um, if it's the UN we're talking about, then they're human rights agencies, mm -hmm. refugee agencies, um, maybe trying to support governments and societies um, in this transition. Um, or they may be, uh, which we can talk about under examples later, maybe trying to impose a, a court, a tribunal mm -hmm. on, on the government or on the society. 
Um, so at the international level, a range of different actors are doing this and they're doing it in a range of different ways. It might be assistance for humanitarian reasons. It might be trying to impose courts. It might be funding different initiatives. So again, the World Bank or the IMF for that matter um, might be trying to fund initiatives. Secondly, governments, the governments involved, the new governments that okay. are coming in um, are negotiating with the old governments that are going out um, or uh, uh, parties that have failed to win a, a victory in a war trying to negotiate with each other. So that national level. Mm -hmm. um, and last but not least, and definitely not least, uh, local societies, local communities, because it may be that money is at the top with international organizations. It may be that the military power or others are with states, mm -hmm. but the communities that actually have to reconcile with each other to live with each other are on an individual to individual basis or a village to village basis. Um, so all, all those different levels are, are busy engaging in this because their experiences of it are quite different as well. Yeah, wow, that's very, that's a very interesting way of looking at it. And I know um, in one article you mentioned um, the um, efficacy of the uh, International Criminal, Criminal Court and mm. whether or not that's an effective um, organ at bringing in justice into these uh, societies that are sort of transitioning from conflict to peace or yeah and it's it's um, there again we, we can talk about some examples right. of whether they're doing a good job or a bad job and I never it's very hard to have a, a fixed and firm one single answer to that mm -hmm. question um, but the, the International Criminal Court is on the international side the newest type of organ because it's it's different from the tribunals that came before because it's a permanent court mm -hmm. um, it's not something that you have to negotiate on an ad hoc basis crisis after crisis after crisis and that's one of the reasons they created it mm -hmm. to have to try to create an institution that was permanent that reflected some understandings of international humanitarian law and human rights law that would be universal and permanent um, unfortunately, it's not really any of those things, but mm -hmm. we can talk about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. So what are some of the main debates in the literature field of transitional justice? Mm -hmm. um, a number of debates. There, 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 there's the oldest one, I suppose, is peace versus justice. Mm -hmm. um, and and is, there, is there, are they compatible, are they contradictory? Uh, this really, it only works as well about the transition from authoritarian to, to democratic rule. Um, an example of that uh, would be the, the oldest example probably of that is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, um, which for those of us who are old enough, there was a feeling, there was a belief that the only way the apartheid regime in South Africa was going to be removed was going to be in a civil war and a bloodbath. Mm. Um, despite sanctions, everything else that had gone on for years, um, which did not seem to be having any effect. Um, but in fact, uh, there was a negotiated transition uh, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a latter part of that, not the initial part, but a latter part of that, where part of the negotiation was in order to get the, the white apartheid regime to be willing to give up power. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted some assurance that they would not be transported immediately to the same jails that they put Nelson Mandela in. Um, so the TRC was a way of assuring a peaceful transition mm -hmm. uh, rather than a, a horrifying bloodbath. Um, but there was not to be there was not going to be a Nuremberg Tribunal or a Tokyo Tribunal for the for the the, the outgoing apartheid regime. Um, there would be a truth commission, um, and some of the people who had perpetrated horrendous crimes could come to the be called to the TRC and give truthful testimony to the TRC um, and have to answer all questions and do it in a public forum. Mm -hmm. um, and then 
if the tribunal was satisfied, the commission was satisfied that they had spoken the truth and answered all questions fully and that their activities were for political reasons, not personal gain and criminality. Right. Um, but if it was a political crime, then they could apply for amnesty and in theory and in practice could be granted amnesty. Mm. Um, so there, there was a debate some some dissatisfaction amongst the, the black South African population around that. There was lots of celebration. Nelson Mandela was coming in. We got rid of apartheid, all of that, um, and 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 we're now in government. But the people who did the crimes are getting off. Right. They're being granted amnesty. Um, so there was that was one of the I guess classic examples of of peace or justice, if by justice what you mean is a tribunal, a court, and a jail sentence. Um, but there were others who said, who thought that justice um, was was not did not have to be that criminal retributive justice. It could mm. be restorative justice. It could be making the society whole again. There were a range of other ideas about justice. So there's, uh, and that, that peace versus justice debate still pops up, um, but I think the literature or our understanding of it has moved somewhat, become more sophisticated because we don't simply compare um, peace meaning no war and justice meaning you're in front of a Nuremberg tribunal. We don't make that stark dichotomy. There's other kinds of justice as well. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the peace versus justice debate, um, which is still alive. And I've bumped into it in Uganda and, and, and now in Afghanistan. Um, in, in a range of different ways that we can certainly chat about. Mm -hmm. um, there is somewhat associated with that the use of amnesties um, or impunity. Amnesty is something that you grant, okay. uh, you give. Um, uh, impunity is what happens when nobody gets punished. Um, so amnesty has to be an actual, an actual political action. Okay. Um, or impunity is is can be a side effect of that or it can be just nothing happens. Okay. No no amnesty but nothing happens. You get impunity. Um, there has in the seventies with people like Idi Amin um, in Uganda, um, one of the places I, I work in, um, he he was he committed many crimes, horrendous things that we don't need to, to discuss. Um, but he was given exile and, and went to Saudi Arabia and lived the rest of his life in luxury in Saudi Arabia. Um, and uh, there are still debates associated, associated with the peace versus justice about whether granting an, a blanket amnesty mm -hmm. uh, is, is a way of at least stopping a war. And if, if in order to stop the war you need to give an amnesty, um, should you just do it? Um, but 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 is that something that that society can live with afterwards? And what about uh, the example that sets to other potential mass murderers or other regimes elsewhere? Or, so that that amnesty debate is a live one, um, and in fact, is being played out now in Colombia and in Nicaragua as mm -hmm. well, um, in transitional um, initiatives there. Um, another one is the the international versus the local or the, the formal kinds of justice uh, versus informal or traditional mm -hmm. mechanisms or, or rituals of justice. Um, and uh, examples of that that people often think about in um, post-genocide Rwanda, when the international community created the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, mm -hmm. um, it, it, could only, it doesn't have the capacity, did not have the capacity, it's finished now, um, to try everybody um, and in the meanwhile and it's a slow moving process for only the top criminals if you will or alleged perpetrators um, but meanwhile there were tens of thousands of, of Rwandans sitting in detention in jails and in horrendous conditions mm. um, and so uh, th and there was not after the genocide had killed intellectuals others there was not the institutional capacity to deal with that so they used, they reverted to gachacha courts, which are um, local village community um, hearings, not really courts, but hearings mm 
um, that were named after the tree that they used to sit under and it was mm -hmm. run by tribal elders could be men could be women um, and a lot of those people were moved through through the kachacha courts mm -hmm. there were lots of problems with kachacha courts too um, but but that that idea of should it be associated with the idea that there is a if there are universal human rights there are universal human wrongs and then there should be universal punishments there's that mm -hmm. international single level if we all believe in universal human rights right then you you deal with that in a in a fixed way um, so there's that notion of should there be international or universal justice or it is what matters in the end not whether for example we in the west or people at the un are satisfied that our standards have been met but whether the communities that suffer through these things are are healed or whether they can move on in which case non-judicial non-court mm -hmm. local rituals um, the often cited ones in in northern uganda uh, were bending spears and drinking the bitter root um, two local ones which were used to to bring people who've done horrendous things back into the communities now that might be child soldiers who've been abducted mm -hmm. um, uh, this is under the the period of the, the work of the Lord's Resistance Army and, and a lot of ugly things in northern Uganda. Um, but to those local community rituals, which might vary from tribe to tribe and region to region, uh, are those good enough? Because those are what those societies need to bring those people back in, assuming mm -hmm. that those people want to come back in as well. Mm -hmm. um, so so those, those are the, the three really big debates, is the peace versus justice, the amnesty and impunity, uh, and then the, the international versus local or the formal versus traditional ways in which to, to do and experience justice. And all of those also affect who's, that first question you asked, who's going to be doing it right. and, and, and how. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Are there any, what you would call good answers to, the, to those big debates that are going on in the field? Um, <laughs> Sorry to put you out yeah, of the No, 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 it's all good. Um, yeah, the really good answer is that there's no good answer, mm. um, it, it, which I'll try to explain. Again, probably the, on the, on the, the South African uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, was held up for a long time as a great example of transition. Um, there was no war. Nelson Mandela became the new president of the Rainbow Nation um, and, and we had a new and peaceful future. There was so much optimism about this. Um, and there was, there was a very public um, truth commission and, and, and there, were, there were many emotional moments in that and there were real instances of reconciliation between uh, a, an apartheid era security officer who'd who murdered a family mm -hmm. and and the other members of that family. There, there were those real instances. Mm -hmm. So that was seen as, as a great example of how a truth commission could work um, and, and how you could try to blend um, truth with some justice because you had to give full testimony in order to apply for amnesty, all that sort of stuff. So that is seen as a, as a great example um, since then, in South Africa, governments have changed um, and there have been problems with governments, but also the social inequality, the economic inequality has, has changed a little bit, but not that much. Mm -hmm. The majority of people who have money are white. The majority, the vast majority of people who still live in, in very hard conditions in poverty are black, etc. So all of those things are still there, um, and there, there are criticisms of the TRC and the process that there weren't reparations, there wasn't a redistribution of wealth. Mm -hmm. you know, they didn't create a whole new education system to bring everybody up from from the, the slums or the shanty towns, like etc. That restorative justice that you were talking yeah. about. Yeah, and and part of the problem with that still for me is. Perhaps it was raising expectations too much of any institution. Um, 
the way I try to think of it over here is, is um, if somebody commits a crime and goes to jail, you don't expect the, the criminal justice system to build schools and, and health clinics. Mm -hmm. It does what it does. Right. Um, and, and, and it may do that well, or it may not, but it does what it does, and it doesn't do other things. Right. Um, so I think part of the problem at times with, with this transition period, and I understand it though, is that people think the transition is going to solve all the problems. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, whatever the mechanism may be, a TRC or just a Truth Commission or the International Criminal Court, um, there's a tendency to blame that institution for not dealing with all of the problems that were created by that authoritarian regime or by that conflict that they're trying to transition out of. Right. Um, so so there's, there are good examples of courts for, and commissions that have done their job. But then afterwards, they haven't solved all the problems of the society. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe, and then you get into the, an issue, for example, the tribunals for Yugoslavia and for um, Rwanda. In total, over 20 years, the international community spent something like three, depending on how you count, count it and what you count, three to three and a half billion dollars on those two tribunals for those two places um, and they held they had trials and there were 300 or so people put on trial between those two tribunals and you know the judges may have done their work very well it may have been a very well functioning court or not separate debate um, but what else could you have done with that three billion dollars mm -hmm. uh, if if you didn't because most of that goes into court costs, and those court costs were the ICTY, the Tribunal for Yugoslavia was in The Hague, the Tribunal for Rwanda was in Arusha, Tanzania. That wasn't money invested in those societies. That wasn't mm -hmm. addressing social and economic inequalities, education, healthcare, all those things. Um, so there is that, that question all the time. You could be a very well-functioning institution um, but there are, are there opportunity costs with that money? On the flip side of it, and this is where I say there's no easy answer, yeah. there's no guarantee that that money, it, it's not necessarily the case that, oh, if that money wasn't spent there, mm -hmm. it would have been invested here. It could have been invested in oil sands development yeah. in, in Alberta. Um, so, so again, those are, when you get into those what if arguments, and a lot of this stuff ends up as what ifs, um, I always try to caution people that it isn't necessarily the case that it's you know, guns or butter or justice or this or a tribunal or or health clinics. There was money for this that might not have been money for that because there might not have been a political interest in doing that. Um, so um, there are good examples. TRC to me was a great example because I genuinely believed that South Africa faced a bloodbath. Mm -hmm. And it didn't do it. And Nelson Mandela ended up moving from prison to being president. Um, so this was a huge, enormous, peaceful transition after decades of apartheid. Um, and if the TRC was part of that, and it was, then it was a remarkably successful institution. Did it solve all the problems of South Africa? No. Um, could it have? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, if you were... A, a husband or a wife of somebody who was killed and you wanted the person who did that killing in jail, do you feel like you got justice? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, but if you if you don't feel that and what you take is a bigger picture, I wanted to know the truth about what happened to my loved one. I want to know where they were buried. I want to have that closure right. and be able to move on again. Then it did a good job. All, all of the places that I look at, um, have institutions and have examples that that you can take that approach to. It's sort of what do you what do you want to un define as, as success, or what do you want to understand as success in those places? Right, and what's a success for one person might be a failure for another. Yeah, and I'm always um, and we can again talk about <laughs> it later. But I'm always conscious of the fact that when I'm in any of those places, I get on a plane and fly out afterwards. Um, 
if you want to be flip about it, I'm, I'm the fly-by white guy mm -hmm. who's coming in to look at these things. Um, so there's also times when I kind of say, yeah, it's not mine to judge. Um, yeah. I, at the same time, it, it's what I work on. So it's what I'm going to look at. But you have to do that with an understanding that that you're you're going to go home and and you're going to go home and watch TV. Mm -hmm. and, and the folks where you are in Afghanistan or Northern Uganda are still there. Right. Um, so who am I to tell them what works for them? Yeah. yeah. So you've got to be a little bit careful. Right now, I was just wondering, are there uh, notable examples of successful and unsuccessful transitional justice initiatives or programs? And I say that loosely, successful or unsuccessful. Yeah. Um, there are. and. In, at least in the place, the places that I've worked in, um, Afghanistan, Kosovo, Cambodia, and in northern Uganda, um, probably one of the most interesting cases, successful and unsu unsuccessful at the same time, because I never have an easy answer to mm. these questions, um, is is the International Criminal Court in Uganda, northern Uganda, um, and uh, I won't go into a long history of of what had been going on in Uganda, but um, at least since the mid-1980s there had been a long guerrilla war going on. Um, pre the current president, President Museveni, had been a guerrilla fighter fighting against Milton Obote. Um, he defeated Milton, or Milton Obote was defeated by a range of different things, um, and President Museveni became President Museveni in 1986, and from 86 to 2006 seven, uh, there were multiple conflicts in in Uganda going on, multiple op opposition groups, the most notorious of which uh, was the Lord's Resistance Army, the LRA, mm -hmm. uh, led by Joe Kony. He had earlier been a fighter for a different uh, group, um, but um, the Holy Spirit movement. Um, but Joe Kony's LRA, in a sense, was made infamous in movies and and. Uh, in documentaries by the, the make, literally the Make Coney Famous or Coney 2012 campaign right. um, and by a number of, of films about, about Northern Uganda. Um, they were stealing children, they abducted 40 to 50,000, it's hard to know exactly, children uh, in that time, um, boys and girls. Um, they mostly turned the boys into fighters uh, sometimes porters, and when they were done with the porters, they would kill them, but mostly fighters. Um, a lot of the girls uh, were, were made into also porters, um, bushwives, or, or, or support, you know, cooks and other things. And again, if they couldn't escape, they eventually might die or just were trapped forever working for them. Mm -hmm. um, now, that, that campaign, that fight, um, was tied into a conflict between North, between Uganda and and Sudan. Um, the Uganda sits on the southern end of what was Sudan and what is now South Sudan. Um, and Joe Kony, um, it is alleged or reasonably well believed, was being supported by General Bashir, recently deposed in Sudan, General Bashir. Mm. Um, and therefore, if he was too hard pressed, he could cross the border into Sudan to get away from from the Ugandan army. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, um, Bashir was being opposed by the Sudanese People's Liberation Army and Movement, SPLA, SPLM, um, which after 2011 became the new nation of South Sudan. Um, but um, he was being opposed by them and therefore Museveni was supporting the SPLA, SPLM. So each president was supporting a rebel group in the other country mm. and then those rebel groups could cross over the borders if they were being pressed too hard and, and hide and resupply and re-equip etc. So it was a really long hard fight and the LRA was very brutal mm -hmm. um, but with transition in, Uga in Sudan uh, the capacity of the LRA to move north um, to hide became more difficult and at the same time, in 2002, the, the International Criminal Court came into force. It was negotiated several years beforehand at a conference in Rome, but it actually became a real institution in force in 2002. And Musev, President Museveni of Uganda, 
as approached the International Criminal Court and asked the court to take up the case of Joe Coney. Mm. Um, uh, partly on using the argument that we have tried to defeat him, we can't, we can't capture him. There was probably a belief in 2002 um, that this new court would be supported by the militaries, the institutions of the West, the intelligence mm -hmm. gathering, etc. And that this new institution with this support would be able to capture Joe Coney, etc. Um, what was notable and interesting at that time was that Coney then began peace negotiations and and this is where the is it successful is it not successful begins um, he he entered into the Juba peace Juba is now the capital of South Sudan but he entered into the Juba peace negotiations which went on for several years uh, through 2005 6 7 8 um, and there is a there is an argument at least to be made that one reason he entered into this was because he also thought the ICC is going to come and get me. Mm -hmm. um, and if he wanted to portray the LRA as a legitimate resistance movement to President Museveni, and, and he argued that he was representing a legitimate movement, um, then he, he did not want to be indicted by the court. He wanted to show that he was a political actor, etc. Um, so there is an argument to be made that the ICC indictment helped to encourage Coney to come out of the bush. However, um, or the threat of the ICC indictment, I should say, mm -hmm. encouraged him to do this. He wanted to not be indicted. But then when the indictment, the peace negotiations seemed to be moving forward, and then the indictments were issued for Coney and the top five LRA commanders and arrest warrants were issued then Coney refused to come out of the bush. Um, mm -hmm. And an argument is, well, why would you come out of the bush yeah. to negotiate peace if you believe you're gonna then be arrested and go to jail for the rest of your life? Mm -hmm. um, so there is, there is an argument that the threat of the ICC and the threat of an indictment encouraged Coney to negotiate for peace. Right. Um, and then there is the argument that the actual issuing of an arrest warrant ended Stop. the negotiation of peace. Um, but while it may have stopped Coney coming out, since then um, the LRA has not operated in northern Uganda. Mm -hmm. um, it was pushed across the border, um, or it had part of as part of the negotiations. It had retreated from Uganda to Garamba National Forest in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Zaire, as it used to be. Um, and it has stayed there. Um, but there was also the belief, an argument to be made, that the issuing of those arrest warrants delegitimized Coney, even amongst the people in the North who used to support him. Yeah. Um, so did it encourage a peace negotiation? It seems like there's correlation, if not causation, because we, we haven't had a chance to talk to Joe Coney. Right. Why did you do this, Joe? Um, but there is certainly strong correlation between the existence of the court, the threat of an indictment, and Coney and the LRA wanting to negotiate peace. Then there's also a correlation or causation between the issuing of arrest warrants and Coney moving back into the, the forests. For the people of Uganda, in a sense, it's been successful because the LRA is gone. Mm -hmm. Uh, the two million nearly Ugandans who were in internally, displa internally displaced persons camps in squalid conditions with disease and death uh, are now emptied out. They've returned to their, their villages and towns. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and in a sense, life has gone on. It's been peaceful since 2008. Um, and, and, and Uganda is a country at peace um, with some political disputes, but in that sense at least peaceful however for the people in the central african republic and democratic republic of congo where joe coney's lra mm -hmm. still operates um it's not successful at all it's just exported the lra to them right. and if you want to put it this way nobody cares um mm. it's unreported uh, or uninteresting you can follow a group called crisis tracker and Almost every single day, they they will report 
uh, LRA guerrillas intercepted some people, looted them, raped somebody, stole a child, attacked a village, etc., etc., in Central African Republic and DRC. Um, and and because it's not Uganda, and because CAR and DRC are in have their own wars going on, mm -hmm. um, in a sense, nobody cares. Um, so the ICC maybe did a good job. Mm -hmm. um, Uganda is at peace. Uganda is developing. People are getting on with their lives, and that's huge for the 2 million to 3 million people in total who were affected. And a lot of the former child soldiers have been able to come out of the bush and reintegrate. Mm -hmm. um, all great, um, but it has exported the problem in a smaller way, but exported it to other countries. And the ICC is not able to deal with those. So um, good example and a bad example at the same time. But that's often the case with, with a lot of these sorts of initiatives as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, something that we talked about in um, a course I was studying on uh, countering violent extremism. Sometimes it's not looking for um, a resolution to the conflict per se, but more um, conflict transformation. So, you know, taking little, um, making micro changes that can help, you know, formulate into something greater, um, but it has to start with the small changes before the larger yeah. ones can happen. Yeah, right? and there's one thing I'll, I'll mention just quickly attached to that is in the transitional justice literature and a lot of the, the language that people use, um, we talk about negative peace and positive peace. Mm -hmm. Negative peace meaning absence of violent conflict mm -hmm. um, and positive peace meaning restoration of relationships and healing and, and, and all good things. Right. Um, and, and, and I understand that we use that terminology, um, but I also it also grates on me. It's like calling civil wars civil wars. There's nothing civil mm -hmm. about conflict when it's mass atrocities. It's uncivil. Um, negative peace, there's nothing negative about peace if, is the, if the alternative is, I'm afraid I'm going to be killed tonight. Mm -hmm. um, ending a war is not, there's nothing negative about ending a war. Um, and I... I there are people looking at other ways to to describe this and one of the phrases that they're now using uh, Peter Wallenstein uses is very well is quality peace mm -hmm. um, so you can talk about the quality of the peace okay. rather than this negative and positive yeah um, and, and again in Uganda there is nothing negative about peace mm -hmm. there it's it's a, an enormous change in the lives of everybody who lives there um, so, so there's no negativity about it at mm -hmm. all. Um, and if the ICC as an institution has had any, anything to play, any role to play in, in creating that, then that's a very good thing. Um, there are lots of discussions about whether the ICC was simply being used by Museveni for other reasons, and we don't need to go down that, that rabbit hole. Um, mm -hmm. but, but again, at least for the people on the ground, if you're not judging the ICC as an institution, for the people on the ground, that period was essential. It turned around 20 years of brutal war where their children every night had to walk to the town of Gulu from the villages um, and sleep on the streets in the town because there were lights and hopefully the LRA wouldn't show up out of the bush and instead those kids stay at home, you know, etc. That's, that's, that's a very positive mm -hmm. um, change yeah. in people's lives. Thank you so much for joining us today, Alistair. Uh, happy to join. Thank you everyone so much for joining us today on the show. I'm your host, Steph Gordon. If you like what you saw today and you want to join us for more videos, be sure to like and subscribe.